Thank you, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I do thank you for inviting me to testify uh, on this timely and important topic uh, today. I had planned to summarize in my brief oral statement uh, the written statement uh, that I provided to the committee addressing current and projected impacts of climate change uh, and uh, also climate science research activities, needs, and products, uh, as the letter of invitation requested. But given uh, the emphasis in some of the opening comments uh, on the emails, I'm going to uh, divert from uh, that program and say a few words about the, about the emails and then finish with the concluding part of my original oral statement. The emails are mainly about a controversy over a particular data set and the ways a particular small group of scientists have interpreted and displayed that data set. It's important to understand that these kinds of controversies and even accusations of bias and improper manipulation are not all that uncommon in science, in all branches of science. The strength of science is that these kinds of controversies get sorted out over time as to who is wrong, who is right, and how much it matters by the process of peer review and continued critical scrutiny by the knowledgeable community of scientists. Of course, openness in sharing of data and methods is very important to this process. And as I think you all know, this administration is a strong proponent of openness in science and in government. And Administrator Lubchenco will have some things to say about public access to the climate data uh, maintained by her agency and maintained by other agencies uh, in the United States. In this particular case, the data set in question and the way it was interpreted and presented by these particular scientists constitute a very small part of the immense body of data and analysis on which our understanding of the issue of climate change rests. The question being addressed by these data was, have there been natural periods of warming in the past, in the last one or two thousand years in particular, that have been stronger than the episode now being experienced? That's an interesting question. And because of the controversy around it at the time most of these emails were written, that is, in the <coughs> early 2000s, the National Academy of Sciences undertook a thorough review of all of the relevant data sets and all of the methods of analysis, not just the data set used by these particular authors or the methods used by these particular authors. The National Academy's report on this matter was published in 2006 and it concluded that the preponderance of available evidence points to the conclusion that the last 50 years have been the warmest half century in at least the last 1,000 years and probably much longer. There is and there will remain after the dust settles in this current controversy a very strong scientific consensus on the key characteristics of the problem. Global climate is changing in highly unusual ways compared to long experienced and expected natural variations. The unusual changes match what theory and models tell us would be expected to result from the very changes in the atmosphere that we know have been caused by human activities, above all burning fossil fuels and tropical deforestation. Significant impacts on human well-being from these changes in climate are already being experienced and continuing with business as usual in the fossil fuel burning and tropical deforestation activities that are the largest contributors to these changes in the atmosphere is highly likely to lead to growth of the impacts to substantially unmanageable levels. The details in support of those propositions are in uh, my written testimony. Let me turn uh, to the closing part of my remarks. Uh, I've tried to indicate in the, in the written testimony and here, that we in fact know a great deal about global climate change, what its causes are, how it works, what its impacts are and are likely to become. But of course there is more to learn, and the federal government is doing a lot in support of the research needed to learn more, and its translation of that research into products our society can use to better cope with climate change. But there again, we need to do more. With that said, I emphasize again that in my judgment and that of the great majority of other scientists who have seriously studied this matter, the current state of knowledge about it, even though incomplete, as science always is, 
And even though controversial in some details, as science almost always is, is sufficient to make clear that failure to act promptly to reduce global emissions to the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping substances is overwhelmingly likely to lead to changes in climate too extreme and too damaging to be adequately addressed by any adaptation measures that can be foreseen. The United States, as the largest contributor to the cumulative additions of anthropogenic, that is, human-caused greenhouse gases to the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and still today the second largest emitter after China, and as the world's largest economy and preeminent source of scientific and technological innovation, we have the obligation and the opportunity to lead the world in demonstrating that the needed emissions reductions can be achieved in ways that are affordable and consistent with continued economic growth, that create new jobs, and that bring further co-benefits in the form of reduced oil import dependence and improved air quality. President Obama is going to Copenhagen to underline that his administration is fully committed to assuming this leadership role. The administration obviously will need the support of the Congress in delivering on this promise, and I'd like to thank you, Chairman Markey, and this committee for your own leadership in this critically important domain. I thank you as well for your attention.